Let's pray. Father in heaven, we do, Father, want to be not always reactive, not always thinking about how to respond, but God, to be proactive and uh, seeing, Lord, as, as has been said, that uh, words have been spoken, Father, about welcoming people, about being ready for you to bring people. And Father, we want to stand amongst uh, those that you can count on, God, that uh, we want to be used of you. We want to be useful in the kingdom of heaven. And so we pray, Father, that as we read your word today, as you speak into our lives, Father, that we would take deeply and personally uh, what you are saying and, and uh, so that we can obey you, not because we've got to, but because we can because we get to, because the Spirit of God is filling us, and because we want uh, to be part of what you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you open your Bibles to Luke chapter 10? <clears throat> Today, um, we're going to read the story <clears throat> of the Good Samaritan. On one occasion, and this begins in Luke 10 and verse 25, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied, how do you read it? And he answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this, and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And in reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man... He passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Who is my neighbor? That's the question of the day, and it's not just the question of the day because I say so, but it's really the question that has been going all around the world in, uh, in recent months, is this controversy. It's uh, manifesting itself in the presidential election here in our country. Who is our neighbor? It's manifesting itself all over Europe as uh, th hundreds of thousands of Syrian refugees make their way across Europe. And I don't know whether you're aware of this, but more than 12 million people have been displaced out of Syria in, uh, the, in the civil war that's there. And most of the people who have been displaced aren't in Europe. They're being resettled in the, in the countries of the Middle East around Syria. So this has had an amazing, there hasn't been a, an occasion like this in modern history of um, the number of people being displaced. There were a lot of people displaced after World War II. There were a lot of people displaced after the uh, war in Indochina. But this is unprecedented. And so people are going into these countries and, and some people are reacting positively and many people are reacting negatively. In a lot of ways, if you think about it, the question of who is my neighbor is a very similar question to the question that Cain asked God in Genesis chapter 4. Cain had murdered his brother, and when God came looking for Abel, Cain said, am I my brother's keeper? Cain wanted to distance himself from his brother emotionally, and he wanted also to bear no responsibility for the death of his brother. So the question of identifying 
who is our neighbor in the scripture this morning rose out of a conversation between Jesus and a lawyer. A lawyer. <laughs> it was one of those pitting wits kind of conversations. The, the attorney, it says in, in the text, stood up to test Jesus. It was another, it had these attempts all the time, it seems, where, where people would, would figure they would take Jesus on. He hasn't heard this question before. I'm going to get him. And they would test Jesus, uh, not just to see what he knew, but to see if they could trip him up. And, and so to turn the tables on Jesus, the lawyer figured he, he would take a stab at it. And, uh, and it's interesting because the lawyer comes at Jesus with a spiritual question. And it's funny how often we mask our real concerns by asking another question that's on the surface and doesn't really get to the core, the root of what's going on. And we use these questions as diversions. So he comes up to Jesus and says, you know, according to the way you look at things, Jesus, what do I need to do to get into heaven? Now, what happens here is that something that you and I need to be aware of, if you're not already, God knows how you think. He knows that all of us, deep within ourselves, we are crafty, shyster lawyers. We are manipulators. We are, look for loopholes in every case. We learn this as children. That if parents said something and didn't cover all the bases, we figured a way out of it, or so we thought. We parse our terms. We, well, it depends on how you define is. You, know, you remember that. We, we look to see if there's any way that we can get away with what we've done. We, we're looking to, for the angle, for some way of avoiding responsibility. And we're, we all do this. Some of us get really good at it, but we all do it. So Jesus says to the man, well, how do you read the law? And the man replied in verse 27 with a, an abbreviated version of the Shema Yisrael. You know, the, that is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God. You shall love the Lord your God. That's the, that's the Shema. And he added at the end of it words that are not in the Shema. Love your neighbor as yourself. Oh, if, if only the lawyer had stopped when he was ahead. You know, Jesus accepted the man's answer, and he simply replied, you do that and you'll be fine. But the lawyer just couldn't leave it alone. Something inside it must be nagging at him, and he felt that he had to justify himself before Jesus. Somehow he needed to redefine terms of, to absolve himself, apparently, of uh, his behavior or any responsibility that he might have toward, toward some unruly neighbor, some, somebody in his life that he didn't like, that he wanted to be distanced from. So he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? That was the man's real question. Now we've gotten down to it. And what's happened is, is that the lawyer may have gotten an A on the written exam, but he was in grave danger of failing the application portion of the test. Are you telling me that I can't simply believe and be saved? No, I'm not saying that. But I do believe Jesus is. I do believe that Jesus is saying that belief that's unaccompanied by a change in the way I live my life is simply not a valid belief, and nor is it saving faith. A belief that fails to impact my life, that's just an assertion. That's not a belief. And it's not the faith that will save you. If you're going to believe in something and put the, all of your eggs in that basket, that something is going to change the way you live your life. Jesus, you know, the Bible says demons believe, but that's not a saving faith. So, who is my neighbor? Now, nowadays, and, and this became very apparent as I became an adult, uh, a friend of mine in South Plymouth, it was after we had come here, I'd been involved with uh, the National Ministry, in our denomination, National Ministries Church Planting Institute, and became very interested in the idea of planting churches around. And, and so this friend was a pastor who'd been booted out of his church, and, 
he, had, he came to me and he said, I want to plant a church. Like, great. So we did a windshield survey around this particular neighborhood in South Plymouth, and we went around to see what the possibilities might be for a church plant in that community. And we found that all these people were refugees out of Dorchester. And they had built their homes. They were fortresses. Um, you know, everything about the neighborhood said, don't bother even coming to the door. You know, and it was, we, gosh, how do you break into this neighborhood? So it's different than when, it, when I was a kid. When I was a kid, our whole street knew everybody. And let me tell you, if Eddie Delacour stepped out of line, my parents found out about it because neighbors told them. But nowadays, nobody knows anybody. The, the, our, our neighborhoods are transitional. Everybody's, nobody stays any place more than a few years, and everybody's moving all the time. So there isn't that sense of, of, of relationship and community. Strangers are, are welcome in the sense that they can move in, but you're never going to get to know them. And so for most of us, a neighbor isn't someone that, with whom you share life. A neighbor is somebody who leaves you alone. You wave to them. Hey, how you doing? But that's as far as it goes. There's, there's not much stretching that comes into, into play in your life as you welcome the neighbor and get to know them and their, their idiot syncrasies and, and, and just become part of their lives. They come part of, become part of yours. And so you stretch and you allow for some maturing and relationship. No, none of that. There's no, there's no allowance for gospel in that way of thinking about community. And that kind of social isolation means that we don't grow much as people and there isn't any real true community in which there's honest and real sharing of life and the kind of love that transcends what you see on Facebook. In a true community the definition of, of a neighbor is broad enough to, act, to, to uh, allow for acts of mercy to be shared personally with people who, who are in need. A true community doesn't need a web page to organize assistance. In true community, the assistance is just given. Who is my neighbor? Now, honestly, it's, it's not really an opinion question because opinions range with your point of view. If you're a racist or if you're a Marxist, your view is going to be very different than if you're a Christian. If you really want to know who is my neighbor, then we would do well to consider not what your opinion is, but what does God say? And if, and, if, and if God gives an answer as to who your neighbor is, that would be the thing to consider authoritative in your life. If we allow God to answer the question, if we let God's answer be the rule for our lives, then that would mean that we are allowing him to be Lord over our life. And when God says who your neighbor is, we might not like the answer. But liking his answer is not my call. God really doesn't care if I like his answers to my questions. My calling as a Christian is to adjust my life. My calling as a Christian is to change my pattern of obedience so that I am obeying the direction that God is giving me. So the word of God does not inform our opinion, it informs our behavior. It changes our opinion. The word of God changes the way we live. The word of God changes everything about all the definitions that we have in life. And we, and we allow scripture to just decide what we're going to do, not the Republican Party, not the Democratic Party, not the Tea Party. We let God be the one who directs our steps. So... Who's my neighbor? Jesus tells a story. And the man in the, in the story who, who uh, gets hurt is not really described at all. All we know about him is he's a man and he was on the road. He could have been a nice man. He could have been a troubled person with a checkered past. He could have been an exploiter. He could have been a bully who hurt people. We don't know. He's just a man. And all we know, he's traveling down from Jerusalem, which is at some altitude, going down to a Jericho, which is at a much lower altitude. So he's walking down this road, and he falls into a pack of robbers, and they beat him, and they strip him, and they leave him for dead. And it's important that we understand that this man 
We have no idea if he was a good guy or a bad guy because the gospel, in the gospel of Jesus Christ, our neighbor is not defined by his moral goodness or badness. He's just a neighbor. Simply a person in need. He had been, he'd had a beating at the hands of really bad people, but he's just a man. Well, fortunately for him, not long after the beating, along comes a priest, a clergyman. And he's walking down the hill also going to Jericho. And apparently he has done his work, so he's not hurrying to get to work. His job is done, and he's commuting home to Jericho because that apparently is where a lot of the priests and Levites lived. So he is coming down the road, and he sees the guy, and what he sees is a bloody mess, and he walks as far away from the guy as he can get and still stay on the road, and he goes around him. Unfortunately for the guy who was beaten. But fortunately for the guy who was beaten, not long after that, a Levite comes along. But unfortunately for the guy who was beaten, he had the same reaction as the priest. And the beaten man continued to lie there, bruised, battered, and bleeding. Neither the priest nor the Levite could plead busyness as the reason that they had no compassion because they were going home. They were had a, on a leisurely walk that wasn't a hurried commute to get there. And without saying so much, Jesus is letting us know that these two men have just had a moral failure. And by saying that, he's pointing out that simple belief without a corresponding change in life does not constitute saving faith. These men were religious, not because God had called them to minister to people, but because it was their job. They got paid to do what they did. And so they did what they did because they were paid to do it, but stepping out of that box to help somebody, to go out beyond, to, to just go a little bit further, to be inconvenienced in some way, you know, I don't get paid to do this. Jesus doesn't even say if they might have fired off a quick prayer to God, God, would you heal that battered man? If, of course, it is your will so to do. Because, you know, God's not going to heal him unless it's God's will to heal him. And we look at this and we say, man, these guys are heartless. But they don't see it. They're blind to their lack of compassion and they're senseless to the hardness of their own hearts. And let me, you know, I can't tell you how many times that's been true of me. How often it has happened that situations come up in, in my life and, and I have walked as far away from that problem as I could get because I just didn't want to do anything about it. Lots of times. And, and, and it happens because fear is the motivation, motivating force in my life. I'm afraid to help. And a lot of times it's me who's crippled by fear and I'm looking the other way and whistling as I walk past making believe I didn't really see the problem. Fear drives a lot of, all of us, a lot more than we realize. You know, you, you start thinking, I wonder if the bandits might come back. You know, return to the scene of the crime, finish the guy off maybe, find me here, what's going to happen to me? What if the bandits left the guy there as a decoy and they're literally waiting for somebody else to stop so they can jump them and, and beat them up too? Wouldn't it just be better to walk by? I mean, surely... State trooper is going to be advised soon. I mean, it's not as though I really know the guy. Who is my neighbor? Well, on the one hand, my neighbor is everybody. But, you know, everybody, that's a concept that's way too big to get your head around. It's too cumbersome. It's too impersonal. You, to say that, you know, the, the whole world needs Jesus. You know, that's, I mean, it's true, but it's so out there that it's, it's foolishness. I can't wrap my mind around millions of everybody's. It's too easy for me to, in, in, to say everyone is my neighbor and then to spiritualize it so all I have to do is pray to God that somebody else might come to the rescue. 
And even though I can't deal with the needs of millions, God seems to be saying that I'm still responsible because God says I'm still a neighbor. And so in, in such a way as to make the point, Jesus made the good guy in the story a Samaritan. Now we all know this because we've been to church for a while. Faithful Jews saw the Samaritans, let's just say, in a negative light. It was a racial thing, an ethnic thing. The Samaritans were descended from the folks that stayed in the land when Israel and Judah went into exile. So they were like the poor people that couldn't, they, the Babylonians couldn't be bothered to take with them. And they were left there. And over time, their belief system became corrupted and, and was skewed toward idolatry. And to make matters even worse, from a Jewish perspective, they were dare I say it, racially impure. They had messed around with other people of different racial and ethnic origins, and they were all a bunch of half-breeds. And so these were not the kind of people you wanted your daughter to marry. These were not the kind of people you wanted your son to marry. These weren't the kind of people you would invite to dinner. These weren't the kind of people you would talk with. These were the kind of people you would say, you stay away from me. You stay on your side of the road and I'll stay on mine. And so Jesus, what was he thinking? Made a Samaritan walk on the same dangerous road. And it was this guy who stops to give roadside assistance. Boy, talk about ethnic hatred. Those people who were despised and rejected uh, uh, in, in Samaria were just as despised and, and rejected as the Muslims are who have been displaced in Syria. You know, no thinking, responsible Jew would allow himself to be seen with a Samaritan. It's like, imagine inviting a Muslim family to church with you. Jews would never eat with a Samaritan. They wouldn't have more of a coffee. And here is a dreaded Samaritan saving the life of a man who himself would never give the Samaritan the time of day. Who is my neighbor? As frightening and as difficult as this truth may be, my neighbor is the one who presents a need that I can meet, whoever that neighbor is. My neighbor is someone who's in trouble that I can see with my own two eyes. Being a neighbor is always going to mean going out of our way. It will always mean being inconvenienced. It will always mean being stretched beyond what's reasonable. Now what the broken guy on the road needed was an emergency department, not the Samaritan. He needed, a, he needed a team of doctors. He needed nurses. He needed real medicine. But all the Samaritan had to offer was some cloth to wipe him up with, some oil and some wine. The guy used what he had, and he cleaned and bandaged the wounds. He wasn't a doctor, but he did what he could do. And the Samaritan even took the wounded guy to an inn and, and promised the innkeeper he would pay for the guy's care. He extended himself. He inconvenienced himself. He went out on a limb on behalf of a man he didn't know. And it appears that the only reason he did this was because there was a serious need right before his eyes, and in good conscience he couldn't ignore it. Boy, that makes me feel good. Who is my neighbor? When we try answering that question the way the lawyer did, we're just like the lawyer. We're trying to justify ourselves. We're, we're, trying to, uh, we're seeking to justify our prejudices, our lack of willingness to do something, to will, our lack of willingness to do anything to help. Instead, rather than lending a hand, we'll say what we heard on talk radio or what we've heard people say on work or at work or we'll, we'll give voice to some of our fears about what might happen were we to extend ourselves. That's what the lawyer was trying to do. He was trying to show that he was already righteous and that he was already for heaven. So it occurs to me in thinking about this that were we to allow him to Jesus would show us who our neighbor is. 
were we to open our hearts to God, God would show us the way he would have us live. Were we willing to allow God to have access to our lives? I mean, God already has access, but were we to welcome him? God would happily prick our consciences. He would cause us to become uneasy with the political attitudes of the crowd around us. He would cause us to become uneasy with the majority opinion in our nation. And God would make us very aware of what he is doing because God is working in the midst of this. You, know, you wouldn't think it that a bunch of robbers laying in wait and whacking a guy and knocking him down and stealing all of his clothes and his money and his shoes and leaving him half dead, that God was at work in that. And you wouldn't believe that when the godly people walked by and they walked on the other side of the road, that that poor guy that's laying there is thinking, come on, help me. That God was at work in that, but God was at work in that. Because sooner or later, that Samaritan guy came along, and he looked, and God worked through him. God will make us aware of what God is doing in this world, and in whom he is working. And chances are it's going to be that he is working in people we would never think he is working because of our prejudices, because of the way we were raised, because of the fact that these people do not look like us, do not talk like us, don't dress like us, don't think like us, don't believe like us. And if, and if we allowed God to, God, we, God would let us be people that he would use. We would be um, God's remnant you know, that piece of cloth that the Samaritan pulled out of his pocket was just a scrap of cloth. It was a remnant. It was a leftover. And that otherwise useless piece of cloth, God would use for his glory and to save some souls. You see, a Christian is a person who is growing in his relationship with God. And, and if you're a Christian and you're growing in your relationship with God, then God is always making you feel uneasy. He's always bothering you with something that he wants you to do that you don't want to do. And, and you can argue with God, and it's okay because God's a big God and he can take it. As long as you lose the argument, you'll, you're all right. As long as you eventually say, God, you're right and I am wrong, I will do what you want me to do. That's when you're growing. Because you're growing in your relationship with him and you're growing in your dependence on him. A Christian is a person who's developing an awareness of the Holy Spirit in his life and who's leaning on God for God to give him direction. A Christian is someone who's learning how to discern the voice of God from all the voices and all the shouts and all the cries of emergency but Will Robinson that goes on in the world today. A Christian is someone who's becoming sensitive to God's moving. A Christian is not going to run away from his neighbor. And it seemed obvious even to the expert in the law. That's the cool thing about the story. When Jesus asked him, identify the person who exemplifies the neighbor in this story, the expert wasted no time in responding. Even he understood. And so also we understand, don't we? That God is at work in our world in some pretty terrible places. God was at work in our lives when we were in terrible places. You know, what's Christmas about anyway? Christmas is about God leaving the comfort of heaven and being born in a horrible situation and being placed in a feeding trough because there was no room in the inn. Jesus became a refugee, for heaven's sake. God was at work in Christ reconciling us to God. Talk about going out of his way. Talk about being inconvenienced. And we have the, the audacity to say, well, that's fine for him. He's God, but God would never ask me to be inconvenienced. God's working in some pretty terrible places. And in those places, there are Christians who are not much different from you and me, and they're working. Timber has a friend who's working in northern Iraq. Northern Iraq. There's a happy garden spot. And yet he is there working with people, sharing the love of God with them, when, you know, like how many of us would say, yeah, that's what I want to do. 
You know, people like him are surrendering their own safety to feed the hungry, to shelter the homeless, and to save lives. They're, they're working to redeem lost people because they are concerned that those people are headed for an eternity of hopelessness and despair, and they want to point them to Jesus Christ. So just like the, the expert in the law, the Christian here in America will also waste no time. The Christian here in America will realize there isn't any time to waste. And we will make a choice, even this little bunch, to be a neighbor to millions of displaced people who today, right now, desperately need us and the Church of Jesus Christ in America to be a neighbor to them. And, and not just to, to, to you know, Syrians who are refugees in Jordan and Iraq and Turkey and, and, and around the, the, uh, the Middle East, the ones that have gone into Europe and the ones that might come here, but there's a lot of people around us who aren't Syrian, who, who are just people who are hurting, who need Jesus, and who look like us even but who need someone to be a neighbor for them. So who's our neighbor? Father in heaven, that's the question that we're going to ask you, and we're going to let you describe to us who, for whom we are to be a neighbor. We pray, Father God, that you would take every point of access into our lives, that every place where, uh, where we uh, have a loophole hidden away, God, that you'd uncover it and and then smash it. Every place, Lord God, where we're parsing our terms so that there's ways for us to get around things, God, smash those things. We want to be honest to God and honest to the folks who live around us so they will see that we are the people of the cross, that we are the people who represent uh, the kingdom of God. And we understand, Father, that this will not be easy, but God, we're living in an awful, terrible time in our world. And how can we lay back and watch as the world goes to hell? And the answer is we can't. So, Father, we say to you, in the, in the words that Isaiah said to you, Lord, here am I, send me.